Well, welcome everyone. I am Kira Epstein, the program coordinator at the New School at Commonweal. And I am so honored today to welcome author Kathleen Dean Moore and sound recordist Hank Lintfer to the New School. Our conversation is co-presented by the Spring Creek Project at Oregon State University. You can find all of our upcoming events by going to our website at tns.commonweal.org. We are recording this conversation and we'll have produced audio and video files available on our website. You can also find all of our recordings on SoundCloud, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify. Finally, thank you for your donations to the new school. You, your support allows us to make these events available to everyone, regardless of their situation. If you haven't already, you can donate on our website. I think now we are ready to begin. Kathleen Dean Moore and Hank Lentfer, welcome to the new school at Commonweal. Tell us both, uh, where are you right now? And maybe what can you see out of your window or maybe more importantly, what can you hear? Well, I um, just returned from our cabin in Southeast Alaska, um, the land of the Clinket people and the Ravens. Um, we caught the last float plane out before the fog shut everything down. So now I'm in my study at home on College Hill in Corvallis, Oregon. What I see out my window is my neighbor's roof. <laughs> All right. And Hank, what do you, where are you and what do you see and hear? I am in my home in Gustavus, um, which is also in southeast Alaska. And I just stepped on my porch for just a minute while this raven was playing during the intro, and I was listening to a raven. It could have been the actual bird that's in that recording. Wow. Um, and then as I was watching the panelists come in, um, I realized that all those locales all have ravens talking, even the our, um, the Folks from Scotland have uh, lots of ravens. So it's nice that we have that common um, language in all of our yards. And this, um, it's uh, 38 degrees and drizzly, and this is the richest time of year here. It is the, uh, September is the month of the receiving of gifts. Um, it's, it's, it's harvest time, the fish are coming in, the gardens are um, asking to be harvested. So um, when I look out my window, I see a world of gifts. Mm. Wonderful. Thank you both. So before we start our conversation, I want to do a little inter introduction for you both, uh, just so that people who may not know who you are, get an idea of what you have been doing in the world. So Kathleen, mm -hmm. I've known you about your work for a number of years, I think maybe since 2015 when you co-hosted the Geography of Hope Women in the Land conference in Point Ray Station. Uh, this year, maybe by accident or providence, I ran across a series of short videos on YouTube that were inspired by your new book, Earth's Wild, Wisd Earth's Wild Music. Here it is, celebrating and defending the songs of the natural world. The videos were so beautiful that they haunted me until I read your book and then until I invited you to do a conversation with us at the new school. We'll be watching a couple of these videos later in our conversation. I am I'm just so honored that you and Hank are willing to be with us here today. So I'm going to read a short bio about you. Kathleen is a writer, moral philosopher, and environmental thought leader devoted to the defense of the lovely, reeling world. As a writer, you first came to public attention with award-winning books of essays, including River Walking, Hold Fast, Pine Island Paradox, and Wild Comfort. Your first climate ethics book, Moral Ground, Ethical Action for a Planet in Peril, co-edited co with Michael P. Nelson and with a foreword by Desmond Tutu, gathered testimony from the world's moral leaders about humanity's obligation to the future. In 2016, you published Great Tide Rising, Finding Clarity and Moral Courage in a Time of Planetary Change, and a novel, Piano Tide, that Bill McKibben described as savagely funny and deeply insightful. Your essays have appeared in magazines such as High Country News, Orion, Discover, 
Audubon, Utney Reader, Earth Island Journal, and the New York Times Magazine. Your website is riverwalking.com. Now, turning to Hank, I learned about you when I began talking with Kathleen and, uh, and, and also when I read the book. You were mentioned a few times in the book, a couple times at least. She highly re- recommended you as an insightful and articulate listener and recordist, and then she had to explain to me what that meant. Uh, among uh, other things, from what I can tell, you crawl around in bushes and through forests and record the sounds of animals. Uh, we heard one of Hank's amazing recordings of the raven before we started, and you will hear some more. Hank, it's been a real pleasure to meet you and hear about your work, so thank you for joining us as well. Um, here's his uh, bio material. Hank is a sound recordist, naturalist, and writer, Faith of Cranes and Raven's Witnesses, wit- Raven's Witness, who lives in Gustavus, Alaska. He and his friend Richard Nelson created a sound library for Glacier Bay National Park, recording sounds from wrens to whales. Spring mornings, he'll be likely recording the dawn chorus of song- songbirds. Fall afternoons, he's likely to be digging spuds or hunting deer. And during winter, when morning and afternoon get really close together and the animals aren't making too much noise and the weather is lousy, he sometimes writes. Hank is also a woodworker specializing in coffins and urns for any of his neighbors who sadly have need for one. In his spare time, he works for the Nature Conservancy managing a nature preserve. Find out more about Hank at humansandnature.org forward slash Hank hyphen Lentfer. So we wanted to start with celebration. And Kathleen, you, in your book, you just, you write about an incredible collection of adventures that happen over this span of many years. And you've, you've listened and looked in so many natural places um, on the, uh, on the beaches at night in low tide with your daughter, seeing the shining eyes of the shrimp and singing to wolf pups and listening for bears in Alaska and boating with Frank, your husband in the dark, listening to whales. You have one of the most unique ways of seeing and hearing beauty in a natural world that I've ever seen. And you share that with us in your book. Every essay you write is a celebration of the beauty you find in all of those places. I've talked with you both about listening and how that helps us to celebrate and appreciate. Um, So Kathleen, why don't you start by telling us how silence, or talking to us about silencing our own noises and how that allows us to attend to the other voices, voices of other beings besides humans, and how that leads to gratitude, maybe, and celebration. Sure. Yeah, we, we live on a singing planet, as we've just learned from, from Hank. You know, everything sings. The trees sing, the frogs sing, the birds sing, the rocks sing. Um, even, even, even the dinosaurs sang, even though they couldn't actually sing, they could certainly fill the forest with their, their songs. Um, but we often don't hear that music. Uh, civilization shouts over it, roaring and thudding. Um, all these expressions of sovereignty and control over the natural world. You know, we're, we're like a soprano warming up, like me, 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 me. And, um, and so we, we don't open ourselves to the sounds that are around us so often. But when we're quiet, that creates a kind of an opening this absence of self, and it allows the larger world to enter into our awareness. So this contact then is a contact with what's beyond us. It's greater than us, this mystery and this beauty. And and what I want to say, and what I say in the book is that listening is a moral act, because when we silence our own stories and we seek out these stories from, from someone else, that Listening is the beginning of a kind of empathy, feeling with, and empathy then is the beginning of compassion. So what I want to um, say is that I think that listening is a moral virtue. And I don't know what, um, why natural sounds speak so directly to the human spirit, but I do think I know what these natural sounds are saying, that we are 
all connected. We are not separate. We are not dominant. Um, we're like the stones and we're like the sparrows. We carry the shape of the world in our rustling. So, um, yeah, we're all music. That's, that's what I want to say. When we open our ears, we realize that we are part of the music of the world. We're all of us. We're all of us matter in motion. We're all of us sending our harmonies out into the, into the sky. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. And so I'll ask both of you then, what do you hear that brings you joy? As I mentioned, um, September up here is the time of gifts. And I'll just describe the morning um, I experienced three days ago. It started in the dark, um, a half mile from my home, and there were wolves howling. There were moose grunting in the dark. Um, and it was the beginning of moose season here. My neighbor had the great fortune of um, shooting a moose and uh, neighbors gathered around this huge gift. And as we worked to take that animal apart, to take it back to our homes, uh, cranes were lifting off all morning. Mm -hmm. um, and so if, if you can be smitten by gratitude, September up here is a club. Um, and uh, and it is all too easy to forget in the modern world that every breath we take is a gift. And when we have the good fortune to be reminded of that, gratitude just floods in. Um, and I, I'm so fortunate to live in a place where the world is constantly laying gift after gift after gift after gift um, at my feet and in my ears. And I don't know that there's any response other than gratitude and humility to live in a world that is that generous. Um, and the, um, you know, uh, I've got a friend who talks about supermarket as amnesia factories because you can go and buy food and leave that store without feeling grateful. You can feel like you paid for it instead of received it when the truth is the earth has given that to us. And, and um, so too often our lives rob us of that um, essential um, Gratitude and the humility that comes from receiving of the gifts. You see, Kira, why I wanted Hank to join us. Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah. So, Kathleen, what about you? What, what do you hear that brings you joy? Well, let me take us back to the city. Um, what, we, what we hear here are the uh, sounds of the Dawn Chorus, which is one of the great astonishments that we live on this music box. And as the world turns, the sun actually starts the music. It, it plucks a little, it's like a music box and the sun plucks those little, those little musical, um, I don't know what they are, but they, they say start the world, they start the world um, singing. And this whole ordering, ordering of birds that call out. And uh, so it's wonderful. It's wonderful to go out on the porch in the morning into this little tiny backyard and start hearing all the birds in their in their order, including the robin. And you say, why are they singing? You know, what are they doing? Is it like I, I think that what what the robin is saying is demonstrating his fitness. He's saying, you know, I am strong. I am alive. I have lived through this night and I have emerged full throated from my dark shelter with energy and joy to spare. And that brings me the greatest happiness, just to hear that very common little guy, that, that Robin. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, I am not a morning person, but I'm going to um, attempt to at least uh, sing my strength when I get up at whatever hour that is. <laughs> um. Okay, so we we had talked about you maybe reading an excerpt from The Sound of Human Longing. You still want to do that? I'd like to do that, yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Um, the one that we picked out is a little excerpt from an essay that's about a musical interval. Wonderful. Um, the augmented fourth. And that's the interval that Western composers often use to express human longing. 
Mm -hmm. And what I've learned, what I learned more recently was that not only Maria, Maria, but loons and wolves, they all sing the same song to express this yearning to connect. So this is a story about the night that I discovered the truth of that. There is no darker night than a night of rain on an island. I sat on an overturned bucket under a tarp stretched between hemlocks. Even under its shelter, it was hard to stay out of the rain. Water bounced off the stems of highbush blueberries and salal, dripped from every stray end of rope, runneled the length of hemlock roots. I sat hunched, forearms resting on knees, and drank whiskey closely rationed. Somewhere, people were laughing in brightly lit places that smelled of books and coffee. Families were sitting down to dinner somewhere, and fishermen were making fast their boats in harbors, calling out to friends as they hoisted their gear bags to their shoulders and turned toward home. But there were no other people here, and not another point of light for 50 miles in all directions. A loud, mournful wail echoed over the cove where we dropped anchor. I was on my feet, reaching for binoculars, but of course there was nothing to see in that darkness. It sounded again. Wolf, I whispered. The howl started low, leapt up, slid along the water, and sank away. I ducked past the tarp and groped to the edge of the island, and there was the howl again. Nothing answered the wolf's call. I listened, as the wolf must have listened, the question probing the clouds and damping out in the forest, the draperies of lichens and drooping hemlock boughs. But the only response was rain pounding, water on water, and the slosh of tide on rock. I should have felt a loneliness close to despair, there in the night, in the rain, a thousand miles from home. What I felt instead was uncommon joy. What was there to long for when all I wanted was what I suddenly had? To be fully part of the night, joined by a song, by a simple shared song to the loon, to the wolf, to the keening of all humankind, all of us together in this one infinite night, all of us floating in the same darkness, each of us as we howl our loneliness, finding that we are not alone after all. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much for reading that. So Hank, I know you have also heard wolves calling. And let me just ask you, does it give you the same comfort as it does for Kathleen? Yeah, that, uh, just listening to you read, Kathy, I just flash back to all these amazing moments I've had recording and, you know, a spiritual opening is any shift in awareness that brings us closer to the truth of how interconnected everything is. And my headphones and my big parabolic dish um, turns out to be a fantastic tool to facilitate that for myself. And when those uh, headphones are on and there's the clarity and purity of a voice pouring into my brain, uh, there are no other thoughts for these brilliant, brief moments. There are no other thoughts but attention to another's voice. And it's, it's, um, it's a joyful experience just to get my own brain to shut up by um uh pouring another voice into it so there's um uh, uh we're going to share a wolf recording this was actually made by my recording partner um richard nelson and he was paddling to shore um to record what he thought were birds and as he was nearing shore he realized there was a wolf just laying on the beach, and this wolf uh, lifted his head and began to howl while he was still in the kayak, and he fumbled with his gear, got the equipment up, um, and the wolf cooperated and kept howling. And when we play this, um, uh, and, and it is a mournful sound, and, it is, and, it's, uh, and it's joyful at the same time. And 
if you listen carefully, in the distance between the wolf howls, and we didn't realize this till later, there's another wolf um, that was probably over a mile away. And um, they were talking to each other. And they weren't talking to Richard. But uh, um, anyway, um, let's, uh, let's play the sound. Wow, that's amazing. I can't imagine having that job of just going out and listening all day long. That that wolf sounded joyful, and it certainly brought joy to me, but it also sounded mournful. For some reason, wolves always sound a little bit mournful to me. So maybe that will bring us into the next section that we're going to talk about, which is uh, the grief of what we're losing in our world. And it seems like the thing that we have to do to be whole and aware in this age is to embrace both the beauty of what there is still on the earth, as well as the grief of what we're losing. And Kathleen, you do this so well in your book. Um, they're both there with each essay that you write, both uh, the joy and the beauty that you feel and see, and also just the grief of what is happening. So maybe can you tell us about some of the facts that you talk about in your book um, or read some of this to us? I, I can talk about that. I don't want to. You know, it takes us into a very, very different place. But I think that it's very, very important for us to to be honest about what's happening to the world to be honest about what people are doing to the world. I don't want there to be any passive voice in this all. This, these are the results of human decisions. But in the 50 years that I've been writing about nature, about 60% of the mammals have been erased from the face of Earth. 60%. And the total population of North American songbirds has been reduced by 30%. Where I hear two robins, I should be hearing three. And when we talk about grassland birds, half of them have been lost. We, I mean, are, 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 are we able to grasp this? Are we able to actually hold this in our minds? Shorebirds, 78% loss. So when I go back to the shore in front of my cabin and I, I count 22 black turnstones, where are its brothers and sisters? And a wandering tattler, there's one. How, how do you how do you deal with this? And as the individual numbers are decreasing, species are decreasing too. So that two out of every five species could be lost by the end of the century. So what's clear to me is that unless we act decisively and quickly, I'm going to write my last nature essay on a planet that's less than half as song graced and life drenched as the world where I began to write half. And my grandchildren are going to be able to tear out half the pages in their field guides. They won't need them. And even when the loss of species scares me, the loss of their, their music, that breaks my heart. Because every time a creature dies, a song dies in its throat. And every time a species dies, that song dies forever. And so the nightmare is that even before we lose all of the Earth's life-saving systems, we're going to lose Earth's soul-sustaining systems, and that's that's the the world's wild music. I'm sorry, that I think is the way it is. Yeah, yeah, and it's a it is that is a somber somber fact, and it's hard. It you know it's hard to look straight at that. And it's heartbreaking, for sure. And parts of your book really were heartbreaking, for sure. So, Hank, 
how how would you like to respond to that? Or do you feel like the woods are quieter now? Each spring, um, when the birds start to come back, uh, in Alaska is, you know, drenched in the big silence is, um, as, uh, I've come to call the, the quiet winter. And I'm always so eager for the return of all these voices and all these songs to liven up on my yard. And, I listen for each species to make sure that each species that has been here actually makes it back. Um, but I have come to hear that decline that Kathy mentions, um, that the numbers are down and I go out and I record and it's gorgeous. All the singers are there but there's not as many. And I second guess myself, but I can go back to recordings I made 10 years ago, right in my same yard and bring them up and put the headphones on and go, oh my God, that is what it used to sound like. Um, And that is heartbreaking. It's, um, you know, you can imagine, I don't know, um, you know, the greatest human choir in the world and, and, and just start plucking the voices out of it. And, and they're going with 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 hardly a notice by our society. Um, you know, when when Aretha Franklin died, there was a degree of national mourning and recognition for the loss of that amazing voice. And all these birds are literally dropping out of the sky, and there's there's no mourning, there's no um, urgency. Um, and, you know, and the humans are still singing. There's, there's still amazing voices coming to fill the gap left by Aretha's departure. Um, there's nothing coming behind the Ruby Crown Kinglet. Yeah. And, you know, Hank, I, I guess I wonder what's the importance of opening our hearts to that. There is so... Um, it's it's just so heartbreaking. It's so hard to hear and realize and understand those facts and those ideas. Why should we open our hearts to grief? The thing that scares me the most is when my heart is not broken. Um, to be in this world and to not mourn what is happening is feels to me to... Um, be part of the living dead. Um, so uh, we can't shift. We can't make good decisions and shift what we're doing without being fully alive. And grief is an integral part of being fully alive right now. So I um, I have to force myself to turn toward it as hard as it is because the absence of it is um, meaning I'm Part of me's dead. Yeah. Um, and Kathleen, um, maybe this is a good time for us to talk a little bit about the animal interlude videos. And is that one way that you're expressing this grief or are there other ways? You know, it's really challenging as a writer. You know, my I feel that my goal is to open people's hearts without breaking them. And that is tough. You know, Kafka said, we need the books that that affect us like a disaster, that grieve us deeply. We a book, a book must be the axe for the frozen sea inside us. So it's important, I think, to write about this terrible silence of an emptying sky that Hank talks about. And I but I try to do it like like a wave on a beach, and a wave on a beach will lift you. And then it'll smash you down. And I want, so I, I'm trying to write in such a way that I lift people with determination and moral resolve, but then let them fall into the shadow, fall into the sorrow, and then be lifted again in that same wild movement that a wave has. So, what does that? Well, music, of course. And so I think that music 
um, can carry us through grief. It carries us into grief and it can then lift us again. So what we've done with this um, project that we're calling the Animal Interludes is that I found excerpts from Earth's Wild Music and I've invited wonderful writers to read those excerpts. People like Jane Hirschfield and Craig Childs and Robin Kimmerer and then put them to the music of um, guest musicians to let people ride this joy and this sorrow to this new place of awareness that Hank describes. And so did you, so these musicians that you found, did they write, are, is this original music just for these videos? Some of it is. Some, some of it you'll recognize and some of it you'll find is um, extemporized. Um, in every case, we tried to do a very nice match between the words and the music. Um, there are 21 of these and they're up on YouTube. Anyone can find them by accessing, or by just searching for animal interludes. And um, I wondered maybe we could play one. Yeah, can, can we play the common mirror please? yellow raincoat, a boy wandered the beach between the high tide line and the falling tide. He leaned over now and then to drop a treasure into his blue bucket. The little boy was whistling. Whenever he's content, he is whistling. The sandpipers piped. A gull threw back her head and brayed. The bell buoy chimed. I sat on a drift log grinning as the voices came together to shake the air into something lovely and pure. The boy suddenly paused and took a few steps backward. His whistling stopped. With his plastic shovel, the boy dug at a disheveled black form, matted in blown sand. It took him several tries to pry it into his bucket. I went to him as he turned toward me. What he had in his bucket was the limp body of a black and white seabird, a common mur. Murs have always been one of the most numerous of marine birds, maybe 13 to 24 million at their peak. But now, in the warming, souring ocean, they are struggling to find the fish they need to feed their chicks and keep themselves alive. I had hoped it would be a long time before the great starving would reach the Oregon coast, but this might be the beginning of it in this blue bucket. I did not talk to the boy about this. Carefully, we emptied the bucket onto a polished log. Here was the body of the myrrh, feathers broken, head hanging. Here was a blue by the wind sailor a small jellyfish with a wing to catch the wind. Here was a mudstone, shaped by the fossilized shell of an ancient butter clam. The myrrh would want to be buried here at the beach, the boy decided, in the place it knows and loves best, where its mom and dad are probably nearby, looking for him. So this is what we did. We dug a hole behind the log, buried the myrrh in sand, and decorated the grave with the treasures the boy had found. Standing erect, looking out to sea, the boy whistled a sad song for the dead bird. And then, hand in hand, we walked back down the beach under the terrible silence of the empty sky. Thank you. 
how long did it take you to put all of those videos and um, essays and musicians and everything together? This was the project of the entire spring. We started out in uh, January and probably ended up in April or so. It was the most wonderful, joyous work. Um, people, you know, it, it, I, I asked my friends, I have wonderful writer friends, and everyone was happy to do this. And, um, and they read so beautifully. I always thought, you know, it would be, un, you know, kind of odd to hear other people read my work. But then I listen to them and they read it so beautifully, so much more beautifully than I ever could. It's a, a complete gift to me. Um, it was very complex. It totally required all of the technology and organizational skills and goodwill of the Spring Creek Project, Carly Letaro mm -hmm. and Shelley Stonebrook and a wonderful graduate student named Jay Baker, who did some of the music too. So um, I really hope that people will, will find those and let them sing to them. Well, I found them and they sung to me and that's how I got to you. So it's working. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, um, go ahead. When I was listening to that one this time and I've heard that before I was just struck by the 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 creative genius of those musicians and Robin and Kathy's words and we are uh, we're just we're such creative geniuses and we do such good work and all that beauty and intelligence um, talking about our destructive sides um, I was just really struck by the embodiment of yeah, our, our, our creativity and our destruction in that one piece. So that was beautifully done. Yeah. So why don't I ask both of you, how, how do you manage to hold both of those things, the destruction and the loss and the grief, as well as the gratitude and the joy? Um. Yeah, that's the question, isn't it? And it's the question that Hank and I have talked about over many long phone calls and over many campfires on the beaches. Mary Oliver um, provided some guidance here. She said, it's a serious thing just to be alive on this fresh morning in this broken world. Yes, let, let's take it seriously. You have to take it seriously. These are grave facts. We are alive. We have been given this fresh morning and human grasping and destruction is, has broken the world. Everything there is true. So we have to honestly, to be honest, we have to hold that discourse, that gratitude and the dread at the same time in our minds. But I think it's really important to distinguish grief from despair. Because I think grief is an affirmation of the worth. There is so much beauty and meaning and love in this world, and we're losing it. Let us hold then a powerful grief, a magnificent grief that is worthy of what we stand to lose. Despair, on the other hand, is a denial of the worth, the denial of the meaning in the world. And um, it says life is meaningless, it is without value. That we cannot allow ourselves to even imagine. So if grief, if grief comes to you, I would say, open the door and invite it in. Let it stroke your hair and hold you. But if despair comes to the door, just slam it and lock it. And Hank, what do you, how, what is your response on that? Uh, I've been holding in my hand throughout this conversation, this bone, which is from a leg of a deer, shattered. You know, this was sticking out of the skin, but this bone, this animal healed. Um, it's, who knows how long it lived after this injury. Um, and this hangs by my desk. And it's a reminder that there is, you know, like water going to the sea, there, there is a healing force pouring through this world. And... My question that I keep revisiting is what can I do to add to that healing force? Mm 
And grief is essential, acknowledging what it was that caused the wound. This wound was likely from the bullet of a, of a careless hunter. Um, and, uh, and it's a question that I re-ask and Kathy and I re-ask each other all the time as we learn more about the state of the world what's the proper response how do we lend our intelligence and our creative capacities toward the forces of healing and and those um we need to heal in a million different ways so there is no shortage of work to be done there's there's no shortage of ways we can all plug into the work of healing and Hank, so you, you've taken us into our next section. We're going to talk about healing and how to move forward as people of awareness and conscious, um, you know, how to hold both of those things and how to heal. And then the last piece, which is what do we do? What can we do? How can we respond in uh, an aware and conscious way? to what we're seeing and hearing and knowing. And you, you've talked a little bit about bearing witness and speaking directly to the truth of the moment. Is there anything else that you want to say about that? And I know we have another recording uh, that we want to play about the, from the whale, from the whale. Um, well, as I mentioned before, this um, going out in doing deep listening is an amazing source of joy. It's, um, it's, uh, there's just so much vitality. I, I, I feel most alive when I am listening to other voices, um, as keenly as possible. Um, and it is a great, um, antidote to the despair that Kathy mentions and despair to me is unexpressed grief, unfelt grief. Um, so again, turning, uh, engaging in the activities that make me so fully alive that I am capable of grief again, uh, is, is what I've learned is my antidote to despair. And, so, I mean, should we move into this recording? Should I set this one up? Um, so this particular recording, I'd been up in Glacier Bay for maybe, I don't know, 10 days. And I had my daughter on this trip and we were coming back down. It was a, a late August evening. The water was just um, slick, smooth, and we could see all these whale spouts in the distance. Um, and we slowed the boat and everything lined up. It takes a lot for a recording like this to line up. There can be no waves lapping the side of the boat. There can be no other boats around. And, and then these cooperative animals. And I hit the recorder. I looked at my daughter and she'd been around this recording enough to know that she could not move. You can't so much as, as brush your arm against your coat because it'll ruin the recording. So we were just locked in silence. We were locked in stillness. And we just shared the beauty of the whales on this August evening. And, uh, and if, if, uh, if smiles could make noise, the recording would have been ruined because uh, our smiles were, um, were like tubas. Um, but anyway, let's, uh, uh, let's hear the recording. What a joy. It's great. Uh, it's great to have all of these uh, stories and 
and sounds to so that I can live vicariously through the adventures that you two guys have had. <laughs> um, okay, so Kathleen, let's turn to the work of bearing witness. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? And I know we have another uh, another video to play. Well, what Hank's recording of the whales so clearly illustrates is the glory of what we stand to lose. This the glory of it. Um, you know, the world is exceptional. It's beautiful. It's irreplaceable. It is astonishing. It is wonderful. And if the good English word for that combination of characteristics is sacred, then I'm very happy to use that word. We also should note that destroying it then becomes a sacrilege to profanity and a sacrilege. And people are surely aware of the word sacrilege, sacra, sacred, legere, which means to steal. So a sacrilege is the stealing of sacred things. It is wrong. It is a cosmic sin. So I don't want to shy away from anger. I don't want to shy away from rage either. But I do want to start with the glory of the, of the world. So what I have selected and asked you to play is about the sage grouse. Um, and I, I chose it because it's the essay that I think comes the closest to combining the glory and the rage. So the reader is Lorette Savoy. The jazz tuba player is Mark Weaver. Hidden behind a log wall, I have watched a football-sized bird boom and dance on its leck. It was the greater sage grouse over in the Oregon desert on a late winter snow-scoured pre-dawn expedition when I thought I could actually freeze to death. the birds were spectacular. Grubby little speck brown birds most of the time, they bloomed on the lek. Their tail feathers spread into a pointy tipped fan, revealing white spotted feathers on their rumps. They draped their wings down over their legs. They shook the feathers around their scrawny necks into a fluffy white boa. Then, the boa parted as their chest swelled, exposing two big sacs like yellow breasts. Unlike breasts I have ever seen, these sacs expanded and collapsed, giving out a loud boom, sort of like boom, boom, ba, boom, ba. As snow skittered across the bare dirt, the grouse hopped and strutted, scratching at the ground. Attracted from miles around, dowdy females wandered over the lek, acting unimpressed, like the pig judges at the county fair. The males scratched the ground bare in a search for love. I wrapped my scarf tighter around my own scrawny neck, and my own chest swelled, I confess it, taking in their desperate yearning. That odd prancing dance expressed, as Robin Kimmerer wrote, the wordless voice of longing that resonates within us, the longing to continue to participate in the sacred life of the world. But there is this. For every 100 grouse that used to dance on this land, now there are only two a 98% reduction from their historic numbers. Fossil fuel developments on public and private land, convoys of white trucks on new networks of dirt roads, concrete pads and bobbing, thumping pump jacks, pipeline routes bulldozed bare, degrade and destroy their sage steppe habitats. Herds of cattle trample the seed-bearing plants the birds depend on for food.
Despite this, or maybe because of this, the government has chosen not to protect sage grouse as an endangered species. When they are gone, the wind will dance alone in the snow. Yeah, well, it is hard to hold both of those things together. It's um, it's it's rough. All those facts, for sure. So what so what are we called to do, Kathleen and Hank? I'm just going to give you the next five to eight minutes, however long you feel like you need. Let's just talk about what are the tools that we have. Um, how can we help? Right. This is the question that Hank and I have been debating. It also, what's what is the thing we can do? And I, I'm thinking about Adrian Rich here, who said, um, "My heart is moved by all I cannot save. So much has been destroyed. I cast my lot with those who, age after age, perversely with no extraordinary power, reconstitute the world. So let's join up with the healers." Um, so the first the first thing to do, I think, um, Hank, and, and then I'll let offer you the, the chance to speak about this is the first thing to do, I think, is to is to find your allies and join together. Every time I give a talk about climate change, somebody always asks me, what can one person do? And my answer always is stop being one person. Find your find your allies. I mean, your first ally is going to be nature. Get on nature's committee. Um, nature is this, it is built to heal. Nature is pl- profligate. It's, 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 it's um, inventive, brilliant. Uh, it wants to persevere. Um, and so sign up on nature's list. That's the first thing. And then find like-minded people. If change is going to occur, I don't think it's going to be because of some, some um, sudden, sudden awakening in the conscience of the federal government, it's going to be from the conscience of the street. People who haven't met yet, that's you and that's me and that that's people that we, we haven't met yet, maybe because they don't look like us. We have to come together and organize for the common good. And Hank, the common good is the idea that you were, you were raising about how important it is for us to escape this selfishness and, and remember again the common good. Yeah, uh, it's the community around the work, um, which is such uh, adds such richness to my life. To have found people heartbroken to the point of action, heartbroken. Uh, to the point that uh, it is driving their creative efforts in the world. And just being a member of that community is essential uh, therapy for me personally. And uh, so the work itself is its own reward is the great thing. Um, yeah. It really is. It's uh, so the, it, it's uh, it's not doing the work, which is the hard work um, to somehow convince myself, embrace enough fatalism that it's OK to not get up and do something. Um, yeah. And it's the it's the fatalism itself, which is both lazy and toxic. Um, so. There, there is just no reason not to find the community and do what you can. And what we can, the answer to what we can do is changing all the time. That is the ongoing question that Kathy and I and others are asking of each other. Um, we, you, you take in what we know of the world, um, what we know of atmospheric uh, chemistry, what we know about the motivations of um, corporations. And 
we change what we do. And I am an incredibly um, conflict averse person, but I am at the point that um, I'm going to put my microphone down and go to Minnesota and join the folks protesting line three and protesting um, the next uh, effort of the industry to keep um, preserving their profits. And that is a real departure for how I've moved through the world. And, um, but that's what I'm personally feeling drawn to for the first time. Um, that it is, that's, that's something I can do. It's, it feels like it's my role now and not my daughter's. Um, you know, the average age of the people protesting line three is far too young. Yeah. Right. Well, it's um, this organizing, this coming together with other people, the indigenous people are showing us the way. It's I, I'm com- convinced that that organization, the ability to come together for the common good is a human superpower. You know, lions particularly have teeth and, and bears, uh, polar bears have claws and and um, some weasels have stealth. But what human beings have as their genetic endowment from the very beginnings of human time is the ability to come together in groups and organize themselves and take action for the good of that whole group. So this seems to me that there's three things that we can do together. In in ascending order of importance, the first thing we can do is we can say, we can stand up and we can say, this is wrong and I will not participate the kind of passive resistance that people are doing pretty regularly all around the world. And I'm guessing that everybody in listening today has taken this route. Um, We take the guilt on ourselves and think that individual actions like recycling or composting or or swearing meat are going to stop this machine. But um, in some ways, those things are essential. They must be done, but they distract us from what Hank calls the scale of the sin of the industrial destroyers. So the second second thing we can do is we can stand up and we can say, this is wrong and I will not allow it. That means, as you do, not another mountaintop, not another river, you know, not another forest is going to be traded away from cash. These are not industries to take or sell. Um, they belong to the future of the everlasting earth. So you go there. This is active resistance that you're talking about now and that indigenous people are showing us. The third thing, you can stand up and you can say, this is wrong. I will not participate. This is wrong. I won't allow it. And now we will show you a better way. And this seems to me to be a call to the greatest exercise of the human imagination that the world has ever seen. This is the marine reserve. This is the community garden. This is the replacement of fossil fuels with energy generation that isn't stupid and life destroying. This is all of the things we can do to create a world that makes sense, that brings us together for a a green and and life-sustaining, life-sustaining work. I think there's still time, but I don't think there's much. Hank, you want to add some to this or dispute me? Uh, you know, I, I agree that our superpower is uh, unity and working for the common good. And the superpower of politicians and corporations is division. Um, and they, they know that so well. They're so savvy in keeping us divided. Um, and I've always been astounded. Why can't somebody just articulate the path that prioritizes the common good and why wouldn't 90 percent of us vote for him um and because um we're so divided and um our other superpower is um storytelling and more importantly story listening so we are all storytellers whether you write or you find yourself on a stage we are storytellers in all the decisions we make and all the actions we take, we are living embodiments of an internal narrative. 
And we can change that narrative by being better listeners and being very um, just aware of what stories we are allowing into our bodies and into our brains. Um, uh, David Brooks, just this morning in the New York Times, had a beautiful uh, essay just about this, um, um, uh, about how do we change our self-awareness and we do it through becoming better listeners. Um, and we listen to stories far outside of our education and life experience that has brought us to where we are today. Um, so we can all agree that uh, going forward, we need to do something radically different than what we've done in the past. So we need to open ourselves up to new stories. We need to be better listeners. The story that we tell is going to be a thriller. The story that has already been unfolding, I think, is a crime novel. <laughs> It could well turn out that the story that we're writing with our lives is a tragedy. But I don't think so. I think that we're capable of writing a story that embodies the kind of caring, kind of awareness, the kind of compassion for the whole world. That is really quite a glorious story. And when people in the future turn back and they say, Grandma, tell me the story about how you made the change. It'll be a beautiful story that we have to tell them. I, I love in your book, um, at one point you say, listening is starting to sound a lot like love. Yeah, it was a forest ranger who listened to me talk about the power of lo loving the world, what the work of loving the world was. And he said, you know, I really like what you say, but at, um, but I wish you could say it without using the L word. <laughs> and I thought the L was really confused. Is he talking about liberal? Or but I realized he was talking about love, that talking about love made him uncomfortable. And at first I thought maybe he was just victim of the same sort of sorrow that scientists are who are trained to this absolute stillness about the world that they are infatuated with. Um, so I said to him, what word should I use? And he said, well, <laughs> How about listen? And I thought, listen, to attend to, to hold in your heart, to open yourself to, to become part of. Gosh, listen will work for me. It's often sounding a lot like love. Yeah. So we're going to move on to some questions now. We've got a couple a couple of questions and comments that are coming in. Um, one of them is, uh, let's see. It seemed like I knew all of these facts and I'm in, oh, I'm sorry, let's see. You mentioned why, why won't 90% of us vote for those who would help and unite? Can you speak to our human shadow side that seems addicted to the rage, division, and fear so much that it has become its own ecosystem that drives politics and politicians who might otherwise have stood up. Uh, I'll hold this back up. Uh, I, I find myself less interested in the source of this wound and more drawn to the power that knitted this bone back together. And maybe that's naive. Um, and, but maybe it's the work of others who to um, attend to the source of the wound. I think it is. I mean, that's the essential work. Um, you know, what is it that addicts us to that division and rage? Um, and I hope there are you know, a million people putting their mind to that question right now, because I think it's true. It's, t it is, uh, I mean, the, the, the wound right now is, um, the bone is being actively shattered. Um, at the same time that we're talking about how do we heal, you have to stop the forces that are breaking it. Um, uh, 
And again, I just, I don't know anything to do other than to listen to and amplify the stories that remind us that we're all connected. I just, I, I just can't come up with anything else for myself. You know, I, I, I am, of course, being a philosopher, I always quarrel with the question, but I would question the premise that we are addicted to rage and division. I think that that's true for some people, but I think that most of us are saying to ourselves, get it done. Leave this behind. There is work to be done that we have to do together. Give me a break. Um, and if you look at the percentage of people who are, are feeding off of fear, it is not the majority of people. I really don't believe that. I think most of us would like to just be done with that and, and to come together with common purpose. Um, those who feel that fear, that um, rage and division, I think, are driven by fear. The fear of loss of their power, the fear of a loss of their control. I think that there's a fear of loss of control over the world. I mean, we're we're seeing the world take charge here, and climate change is is um, it's frightening. It's terrifying. It, it's dreadful. Um, so there's that fear, and then there's the fear of people who don't like look like you becoming a majority in a democracy. I think that's feeding the racism. I think that. The fear of losing their power of the great corporations is driving that kind of horrible actions. Um, but let's think about that and think about the way in which the bullying might be a sign of coming change. And that the stronger the shouting, the louder the shouting and the stronger the bullies are, the closer we are, that's a sign that the closer we are to real dramatic change. Maybe. <laughs> great. Okay. Well, we have an we have a great question from Anne, who is a U.S. grad student in Scotland. She asks, "What do you think humans' wild music is in this critical time in nature?" What do we think the music of humans is? What is, is the wild music of humans? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Should we start with the murmurs of the mother to the newborn baby? Should we start with the lullaby? Should we start with the, the rustling against, against leaves? Should we start with, with the, the way we make music out of everything we touch? Should we start with the way that, that um, long, long, long ago, people made flutes out of the bones of the cave bears? Mm -hmm. I could talk about this going into a campground in the Four Corners area and listening to a flute in the evening made out of the bone of an eagle. We make music every chance we get. My grandson whistles, my granddaughter sings. They can't be silenced, um, except by sorrow. Uh, we are oh, wild yeah. creatures and we make wild music. Go, go Hank. <laughs> <laughs> and I would add um, that wailing and crying is wild music, and it and it's uh, like laughter. It it's, it's its power is in uniting us. And I have sat with neighbors in deep grief, and it's been profound when somebody reaches the point that they realize how much grief there is and how many people have lost their partners, how many people have lost their children. And in the depth of that personal loss, boom, they all of a sudden are blown out to feel the magnitude of sorrow as a human experience. So that's a wild, beautiful, uniting sound of, of, of the purity of real grief. Um, so there's there's just wild music everywhere. Yeah. Okay, here's another one from um, from David. He says, "How do we reach out to people that are way on the other end of the political spectrum?" And uh, I would say to create that kind of community, Kathleen, that you've been talking about that those groups of people. How do we? How do we combine with people who who just how do we reach them? The question that often comes is is what do we say to them? 
What can we say to a person who doesn't believe in climate change? What can we say to a person who believes in these these conspiracy theories? And my uh, my answer is is nothing. Listen instead. Listen. Um, I have a brother in law who is diametrically opposed to everything I do. <laughs> Um, he goes on my website and he just gets furious. And so I invited him out to lunch and I said, you know, um, what I want to do is just listen to you. You tell me anything you want. I won't repeat it. I won't. I won't dispute it. I just want to hear what you think. And there's this long pause and he says, OK, he will. And and he he started out and for for the whole meal, he told me things that every single thing I thought he said was false. Many of the things I thought he said were cruel, but he went on and he went on and I listened. And then when he was done, it was a long silence. And then, um, then he said, well, what do you think? And that seemed to me to be a turning point that we might be able to reach if we start out not saying something to people, but listening. I, I would add that across our politics, you find a common yearning for the sacred. Um, there are a billion Catholics on the planet who they, you know, they, they cover the sacrament with a cloth. It's an act of the sacred, taking in the body of Christ. And how far is it to take that reverence, that that sacredness, and realize that the earth itself, our, our food, everything is the body. And it deserves that same respect. So we we are drawn to it. Um, and it doesn't matter who we vote for. We uh, we we seek the sacred. And that is a common um, source of common ground. So, Kathleen, in your book, one of the chapters is called Hope is Not the Thing with Feathers. <laughs> And we have had a lot of conversation at the New School and at Commonweal about hope and what that means and whether it's the right thing. Or I, I just wonder if you want to talk a little bit about what you think hope is. Yes. Um, the essay begins with uh, Emily Dickinson's famous poem, Hope is a Thing with Feathers that Perches in the Soul and sings a song without the words and never stops at all. And we usually see that poem illustrated with this little bird, this little blue bird of happiness. And um, over the time that we have seen hope fade, I'm beginning to think that that's exactly the wrong bird. She's not talking about the bluebird of happiness. I mean, this is this is a time uh, right before the Civil War when she was writing. This is a time when people are dying of cholera and diphtheria. Children were dying. Soldiers were marching forward. Um, she wasn't talking about any little sweet thing whispering to you. She was talking about something with talons. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Rebecca Solnit, I hope I can get this right. She says, hope is not a lottery ticket that you sit on the couch clutching. Hope is the red ax that you seize to break down the door in an emergency. And um, that, that I think is right. So, um, so I think that hope is action. I follow Joanna Macy in that, that we can find our hope in, in action. Um, we can find our hope in strength. And so what we need Maybe what we need isn't called hope so much anymore as it's called courage. Or maybe it's not courage so much as it's called strength in numbers. Um, hope is not a passive thing at all. It's active. Call in all the feathered things that are perched somewhere in your weary soul. Call in the harpy eagles and the sharp-shinned hawks. Call in the booming cassowaries and the shrikes. Call in whatever character traits Velociraptor and the extravagantly feathered Tyrannosaurus Rex have embedded in your reptilian brain. Hope is not all we need. What we need is strength, strength in numbers and strength in moral conviction. What we need is shrieking, roaring courage. Wonderful. <laughs> that was fun to write. I bet. It sounds like a lot of this was fun to write. It was. It's true. So 
So we're we're coming towards the end here. I'm not seeing any more questions. So I wonder if what we could do to uh, to sort of close the arc of our conversation is to ask both of you if there's any final words that you feel like need to be said, or that you'd like to be heard, or that you'd like to end with. Hank, hey. why don't you, you want to start, Hank? Oh, my days are just so steeped in gratitude right now. It's hard for me to really think of anything else, but it is such um, a powerful place to find myself that I would just encourage everybody to seek out the places, the actions, the company that nourish gratitude. Gratitude um, seems to me the pool to which all great things flow. Um, and I find it when I'm doing action that isn't aligned with my beliefs. It makes me feel grateful for that opportunity. Um, when I'm reminded of the great gift of just being alive. Um, so that's my final thought is just go and Allow yourself to receive the gifts that grow your gratitude. When um, Hank talks about gratitude, it's making me really wonder, I think, and, and I'll put this out to your listeners to see if they believe it. I think it's impossible to be grateful and sad at the same time. Um, and as we're grateful, we should be also aware that along with the gifts comes the obligation to reciprocate in some way. And Hank taught me this when I lived in Gustavus um, in, his, in his cabin that he built for his mother and father. They gave me gift after gift after gift. It was a pizza with venison on it. It was a, it was a box of, um, of um, high bush cranberries. It was a, a drawing by a little girl in a red jumper. Gift after gift. Um, and I felt I felt, I said to Hank, I, I don't know how to accept all these gifts. Um, and he said, well, then you are going to have to learn. <laughs> Do you remember that, Hank? <laughs> and the way to learn is to practice. <laughs> so I think he's right. Go outside. Be aware of what you're given. Be aware of all the gifts that you are given. And then ask yourself, what am I going to do for the giver of these gifts to reciprocate? What am I going to do? for the earth to reciprocate? What am I going to do to give back all these gifts? And that I think is, this, is the shape of our work to come. Wonderful. So uh, I, that reminds me of a, there was a um, quote from your book that I loved that I, that I just happened to write down. Uh, we must empower forests to save our skins on the chance they may also save our souls. I just love that. And what does it take to empower a forest? What does that even mean? You know, what can we do? How can we do that? Um, and we all have our own ways, as, you, as you've pointed out. So, you know, um, I think we'll, we'll come to a close at this point. We Just a reminder to everyone who's listening, we'll have recordings produced of this conversation in a week or two. If you're on our mailing list, uh, you'll see a notice about that, or you can follow our feeds on SoundCloud, Apple Podcast, Spotify, or YouTube. Uh, again, please consider making a donation to help us keep these programs going. Each donation is so important. And um, before, before I close the recording, I just want to let you all know that we're going to play another recording from Hank as we go out as people are filtering out and as we close close up here it's a course of sounds so hank do you want to tell us a little bit about that and set that up for us um yeah this is just a mix up of uh of wild voices and i always like when uh, we have an opportunity to give a non-human uh a more than human uh the final word so this is just a mix of voices from uh the, I, yeah, they're all Alaskan. Um, some of them have feathers. A lot of them, a couple of them have really big teeth. Uh, but other than that, I just uh, invite everybody to listen. Okay. 
So Kathleen Dean Moore and Hank Ledfer, thank you so much for being with us at the New School at Commonweal. We'll see you next time, everybody. Thank you.